Hi divers, Ali Pierce again, Scuba 2000, vintage scuba, yeah, talking about the old stuff. I really enjoy talking about the old stuff, old scuba diving gear. I started diving in 1958, different world, and certainly as far as scuba was concerned, I enjoy talking about it. I don't enjoy diving with it, so, well, we still do that, actually. I don't know if you are aware, but we actually have vintage dives, that's right, vintage dives, and, and, and a guy, divers will choose a site and get together, and they're you know, all from all over from all over. A very popular spot is in northern Ohio, just south of Detroit. It's only about two and a half hours from Toronto. And we get together there every year, usually in August, and it might be anywhere from 50 to 200 divers show up. And it's, it's a vintage dive if the equipment you're using is older than 1975. Nothing newer than 1975 is allowed. Most of the divers have two hose regulators and they have old steel tanks, old mat. It's a lot of fun. We get together, we have a swap meet and we swap stories. Most of the swapping is the story. But we have a vintage, that was a lot of fun. So we actually do use this old vintage equipment from 40, 50, and even 60 years old, uh, long ago. It's a lot of fun, we're a lot of fun. But uh, the modern scuba equipment is much, much better, easier and safer and so on. But anyway, I want to talk to you today about something kind of interesting. This is kind of odd, probably won't see this anywhere else. Not very likely anyway. We did talk in one of my uh, Vintage Scuba episodes about J-valves and K-valves, and I talked about the fact that in those days, in the early scuba days, you had to have a J-valve, which gave you a reserve. You had to have a J-valve because although we had pressure gauges for on the surface, you could check your tank before and after a dive, we didn't have any submersible pressure gauges, so you couldn't see how much air you had. With the J-valve, when your tank was almost run out, down to about 300 PSI, then the air would slowly cut out, and you'd reach back and flip the J-lever, and, uh, and then you get an extra two or three minutes of air. It worked, saved a lot of divers, but it wasn't perfect. You need to realize if you were very, very deep, as an example, we didn't dive as, as deep as in, in the old days as we do now, but if you were very deep, maybe 100 feet, which is considered a pretty deep dive, if you were 100 feet deep and using a J-valve, and your pressure dropped to the reserve limit, 300 PSI, and you activate the reserve, good, you can breathe again, but you don't have enough air to get back to the surface. How about that? If you're 100 feet deep and you have 300 PSI, you can do the math. That's 10% of the air left in your tank. That's not enough air to get you back to the surface safely. So uh, diving today with a pressure gauge, you can actually monitor your pressure and see how much you have. It's much, much better. But there was another interesting development at about that same time in the late 50s, early 60s, into the mid-60s. Pressure gauges didn't come out until 1962. I think I mentioned about this old sea view gauge, the very first pressure gauge. You couldn't swivel it. You had to look right at the end of it, brought out by my good friend Sam LeCoq, called the sea view gauge. That came out in about 62. But a lot of divers didn't buy them. Darn things were expensive. They were they were fourteen ninety five, and, uh, and, and that was a lot of money in those days. And so a lot of divers didn't buy SPGs. Besides, they had the J valve. So who needs a pressure gauge? It took a little while, you see, for the benefits of certain things that had developed in scuba to catch on to be widely accepted. So while all that was happening, all that turmoil, other manufacturers came up with other ideas to help a diver monitor his air supply, or at least to know when he was getting low on air. And one of the more interesting uh, things that came out was the sonic regulator. There was actually a sonic valve. It's actually a valve, and it had a knocker inside the tank. So when your pressure dropped to 300 psi, it would <laughs> on the side of the tank. That was pretty neat. Wasn't very good though, wasn't too reliable. But there were a number of sonic regulators. What's a sonic regulator? No, it doesn't play MP3. That's coming, but not yet. But a sonic regulator was a regulator that talked to you. Ah, they didn't really talk to you, didn't use words or anything, but it was a regulator that warned you audibly when your air pressure was getting low. Well, that's kind of neat. Well, it was kind of neat in the 60s. We don't use them today with pressure gauges. We don't need them, first of all. And then secondly, it was a mechanical device. So it was subject to breakdown. They weren't terribly reliable. There was a lot of pressure in there, a lot of wrapping and banging of metal parts, and so they tended to wear out pretty quickly. But I wanted to show you one of these. It's not likely you'll see another one. There. They are around, but of course they're not made anymore. And this particular regulator made by an excellent company called Healthways, I've been gone a long, long time, but it was a big company in the 50s and 60s. I think they closed up in the late 60s. Excellent company. They had a very innovative company. They had a lot of great ideas. And one of the, they were one of the uh, mo most popular sonic uh, regulator uh, developers. There were other companies as well. I think Scuba Pro had one and some other companies too. Voight did. Voight's gone too. Uh, but uh, Healthways was probably the most popular. And they made beautiful regulators. Look, look at these regulators. Come in a little closer here, Kevin, if you would. Look at this. This is a Healthways regulator. 
Isn't that beautiful? That reminds me of, of my 56 Buick. Big chrome bumpers. And look at even the exhaust tee. Today, they're all rubber. Even the exhaust tee is beautiful chrome. Isn't that gorgeous? And the first stage with heavy, heavy chrome. This first stage weighs about 10 pounds. Kind of neat. And this is one I showed in my earlier episode of the J-Val. J-Val Constant Reserve built right into the regulator. Look at this neat built-in internal yoke screw. No knob outside. You see, it's built in. They had some wonderful ideas. And one of the ideas they had was the sonic regulator. I'm just going to show you quickly how this works. It's pretty neat. If you had the extra 8 or $9, at a sonic regulator cost, as opposed to a normal regulator, and remember, eight or nine dollars in many, in lots of places in North America, was uh, was a day's wages. So you thought about it, then you could get the sonic regulator. In fact, I think that this regulator, Kevin, if you if I hold the steel, you can see it says sonic right on there. This is the Healthway Scoob Air Sonic. Now, if you're familiar with these, you can tell it's a sonic regulator. I can tell by just looking at the regular it's a sonic. You see this extension? This long piece on there? That makes it a sonic. Here's another first stage with a long piece on it. This is a sonic first stage. So sonic regulators or regulators to talk to you. So how did they work? Well, it was really very simple. There was a mechanical device inside the regulator right in this long extension here. And when the pressure got down to 300 PSI, it would speak to you. So here we are breathing enjoying our diet. Okay. As the pressure drops to 500 PSI, listen. Every time you breathe in, or every time you sucked in, uh-oh, I got low on air, gotta go up, guys. How about that? Seems like a good idea? Yeah, my regulator talks to me. Actually, they weren't terribly, terribly popular, hence the fact that you can't find many just around anymore. They didn't sell a lot of them. First of all, they were more expensive. Uh, mechanically, they weren't 100% reliable at all, and reliability, uh, while well, scuba diving is critical, you all know that, so they weren't terribly reliable. They did cost a little bit more to service, but there was another reason. Now, it has to do with the fact that <clears throat> scuba diving in those days was a manly sport. If you didn't have a hairy chest, you couldn't be a scuba diver. I'm joking. Of course, there were lots of ladies involved in the sport. But it was considered <clears throat> a slightly risky sport, pretty for he-man, adventure sport, if you like. And we all know that's not true. It's a great family sport. But back in those days, it was a manly sport, you see. And if you had a sonic regulator, are you ready for this? And it went off. It indicated to all the divers within 100 feet or so that you were out of air. You were an air hog. Divers didn't want that. Divers didn't want other divers to know that they used air up too fast. They actually would avoid getting this kind of neat, worthwhile safety device because it affected their ego a little bit. How about that? Things have changed. I like to think they're changing. Anyway. So there you go. A little bit of a little tidbit on sonic regulators. You probably won't ever see one of these again. And the reason why it was interesting at the time, no pressure gauges. So I hope that you enjoyed that, and you've seen the sonic regulator now, so the next time you're at your club meeting or talking to your other diver, you can say, hey, I saw a sonic regulator, and they say, what was that? And you're going to tell them all about it. Hope you enjoyed that. Talk to you real soon. Alec Pierce, Vintage Scuba.